The International Olympiad in Informatics is a competitive programming competition for high school students that happens every year. Students compete by programming under time pressure and submitting their code to an online judge that scores programs based on their efficiency. Competitive programming not to be confused with the other CP is nothing like making a website, game, or app. Programs are expected to solve very specific computer science problems with a text input and an expected text output in which the format has to be very exact. Myth zero, computer science is about writing code. This is a common misconception among high school students that take IT as a subject. In a typical IT course, half the class is still learning to write Python and Microsoft Office is being taught for the millionth time. So when I first heard about the Informatics Olympiad, I completely choked on the first round because I was busy making the best game in the worst game engine for homework. Now, competitive programming has a lot of theory, but a few of the things you learn are actually useful. The sheer number of ideas you need to memorize may seem daunting, but in this video, I will take you from beginner to competitive programmer step by step. Step zero, get the foundations right. A little bit of programming experience always helps. I recommend learning any of these languages well so that you can practice solving problems independently without having to consult the documentation too many times. Even though the programming language used at the IOI is C++, it's more important to become confident with applying algorithms first. If you are more confident with Python, then write your solutions in Python. Learn the concepts before you lose sanity over C++. Step one, use the correct strategy. Before writing code, always identify the type of problem you're dealing with and plan your solution. Pay attention to the constraints of each subtask as they can give you hints on how to approach the problem. Take this problem for instance. The number 45 is oddly specific for an upper bound, but some nerds might realize that it's the sum of all single digit numbers. This lends itself nicely to the discovery of a brute force solution. Creating your own test cases and solving them by hand can help you identify a pattern. Make sure to always consider the possible edge cases that could mess up your program because accounting for edge cases is sometimes the most time consuming part and can make or break rankings. Step two, analyze and optimize. First, code the simple but slow brute force solution. It's better to get some points on a subtask than getting none and wasting lots of time. Then calculate the time and space complexity of your code using big O notation. This is for identifying the bottleneck. Which part of your code is using up the most resources? Are you repeating the same calculations? Your goal is to optimize your solution so that it solves the problem significantly faster than it did for worst case scenarios. This is where algorithms and data structures come in. Knowing the right tool for the job could be the difference between getting a hundred or nothing. At the beginner level, most tasks you encounter will be differently worded versions of problems with well-known solutions. You won't come across anything worse than some basic math, sorting, and binary search. The only data structures you will use at this stage will be arrays, sets, and dictionaries but things get difficult pretty quickly. Step three, memorize common techniques. To be successful under time pressure, it's crucial to have certain algorithms at your fingertips. Common techniques you should understand as a novice include sorting, binary search, and prefix sum. When finding the sum of the k largest elements, it's probably a good idea to sort the collection in reverse and take the sum of the first k numbers. Don't shoot yourself in the foot by reinventing bubble sort. Just use the built-in sort function unless you use JavaScript. When planning your code, always look for order. The problem might have some properties that make values secretly behave like sorted items. In situations like these, binary search could be the ultimate answer. Make sure to understand how this code works because most of the time, you will have to adapt the algorithm to account for the specific quirks of the task. Whenever there's a sequence of numbers that never changes and you frequently have to calculate the sum of a range, a prefix sum is your best friend as it stores the sum of all the numbers up to an index. This means you can pre-compute the prefix sum and use subtraction to save time. Sometimes you have to combine different techniques to reach the optimal answer. Take a look at this puzzle. The first skill being tested is the ability to use a prefix sum. The cost of traveling between two stops can be calculated with the Pythagorean theorem. A naive approach would be to store the cost for each stop and then perform a range sum every time you needed to check how much money Ivan had left. We can reduce the time complexity of this operation 
by using a prefix sum. The hard part is figuring out that the number of reachable cities is always decreasing and that a city that is reachable from the current stop was reachable from all the previous stops. This property gives us the opportunity to use a binary search for each city to find the exact index where it becomes unreachable. Then we increment the number of new unreachable cities at that index so we can total and output the number of unreachable cities at the same time. Step four, learn dynamic programming. Dynamic programming is so common at Olympiads that it's an essential topic to cover. The essence of dynamic programming is avoiding recalculation by using answers to sub problems you have already solved. Most of the time, it just means storing the results of previous calculations so that you don't have to do them again on accident. A common example is the Fibonacci sequence, where storing the two previous numbers is more efficient than blind recursion because you are preventing the program from calling the same function with the same inputs multiple times as illustrated by these diagrams. The process for dynamic programming is making a recursive function, then identifying the subproblems, and finally using an array or dictionary to store the results of these subproblems. However, to solve a problem with dynamic programming, you have to make sure that the recurrence relation exists and that your recursive function does not rely on the external state of the program. This solution is wrong. In the for loop, you can see it modifies the board, which isn't one of the parameters, causing a side effect. If you wish to see an in-depth video on dynamic programming, make sure to like and subscribe to support this channel. Step 5. Study your data structures. At this stage, you can crack the easy problems, but some of the harder ones still look alien to you. If you want to truly be competitive, it's essential to know the pros and cons of various data structures, like when you should use a dictionary versus when you should use an array. This is also where understanding the big O notation is important. This is the point in time where you begin to learn about a million types of trees and graphs and the algorithms associated with them. For trees, you need to know DFS and BFS, which are easy to grasp, but you will also get hit with the occasional binary search tree. In fact, you could even be asked to make a red-black tree. If you want to get into the top 42% of DMOJ users, then you need Dijkstra's single source shortest path algorithm. It's just BFS with a priority queue. Too bad your scratch platformer doesn't support heaps. Wait, no, I'm wrong. Step six, grind. You've mastered the basics and it's time to grind every lead code and code forces problem. During your journey, you will encounter these algorithms and pretend to understand them. Thank you for watching and I wish you the best of luck.